Okay, uh, I wanted to thank the organizers for inviting me here today. I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Uh, I will be talking about genetics and identity, uh, but I will be building off of a study that I've been conducting with consumers of 23andMe, uh, the company that Joanna um, represents and described in an earlier session. And um, what I'm going to talk about um, is actually a good segue into the next session because I will be talking about uh, ancestry testing in the context of, um, uh, of health results. Um, so uh, as an anthropologist and someone who's been very interested in research ethics, um, I, I put this up here just to, to give a sense of that, that science and technology, we know are dynamic, but that the value that we derive from that uh, must be understood within the social and moral context. And, um, and to think about uh, the ways in which genetics enters into the social landscape, um, in particular the significance of the gene in, in understanding how um, consumers, the public, uh, takes up this type of information. And I would suggest that uh, genetic information has the allure of specificity and technological precision. We've heard those words used over and over again today. Um, that individuals often turn to genetic information to validate one's sense of self and predict one's future. Um, and that, um, perhaps most importantly, genetic information may trump other sources of information uh, for identity formation. And ancestry, uh, genetic ancestry testing, I think, um, really builds on this idea of discovery. I mean, here we have a, uh, this is just from um, African ancest ancestry, but it talks about this answer that uh, presumably the consumer would want to find out. Um, and it is about uh, this idea of self-discovery. Uh, um, and Dorothy Nelkin um, talked about this a while ago, but uh, really tries to think about how genetics might change our conceptions of family, for example, one social group. Uh, and, and, and to think about the ways in which DNA, um, its durability, its per, the, the seemingly permanent significance of, of DNA may uh, change our, our cultural ideas about what a family is. Uh, this summer, I've been very interested in the ways in which the media picks up on some of the genetic ancestry research. And this is uh, from the New York Times, and it, uh, it's talking about a study that was conducted uh, by a group in California um, and the, uh, the original papers in PLOS Biology, but the, you'll see that the, the headline reads, Genetics Reveal Europe is One Big Family. And underneath it, um, I don't know if you can, you can tell, but um, it's a picture of um, a group in reference to a neo-Nazi trial um, that's been occurring. And, it, and the article starts off by saying, from Ireland to Turkey, Europeans are all related, sharing a link with ancestors who live, who were alive just 1,000 years ago, according to a new genetic study. Research uh, by scientists in California is further evidence that neat distinctions between various European peoples are largely artificial and that they are all one big family. Um, it goes on to talk about um, that that recent research has focused on the shared legacy of Europeans, and this is in contrast to earlier theories that focused on differences, um, but alludes to how uh, persistent ideas about racial difference continue to be a source of prejudice and violent crime. And I think this juxtaposition um, is an interesting one and, and perhaps um, can help us think about how genetic um, identity might be coming online in terms of how the public uh, might be interpreting some of this information. Now, potentiality, um, I put it in the title, and it's, it's, it's a concept that um, has been helpful to me in thinking about the power of genomics or genomic information. And here I've tried to define it, um, potential defined as embedded with latent qualities that may realize future utility or revolution, uh, revelation is often interpreted as synonymous with possibility, capability, and power that suggests a potency that evokes both desire and fear over how to translate biology into promise. So for the last uh, several years, um, perhaps since the uh, Human Genome Project, the completion of the Human Genome Project, we have been talk talking about um, the, the type of promise that this, bi this new biology is, is supposed to deliver on. And I think a lot of our ideas are built around this idea of potentiality and what that information can provide to us. Um, I think uh, before I get into some of the, the, the research results um, from my study, I wanted to also put up Catherine Nash's quote about geneticization of identity. 
and in particular, how the interpretation of genetic, genetic knowledge might create new definitions of gender, race, and rel uh, relative that either reinforce, reshape, or perhaps challenge existing notions of collective identity and personhood. And I think that, that that's a question um, that perhaps we can begin to answer with the ways in which uh, genetic information is being interpreted by the public. Um, so, and the other aspect that I wanted us to think about today is just uh, the way in which genetic ancestry testing has been depicted, at least in the past, um, as recreational, and some of the limits in thinking about that framework. Um, particularly, I think gen personal genetics has primed an expectation that this is uh, both recreation and recreation in the sense of oneself and the recovery of one's unknown ancestors, and I want us to think about uh, the different stakeholders that are involved in that process. Um, in particular, um, thinking about the ways in which genetic ancestry involves an engagement with concepts of difference, ethnicity, race, genetic variation, and what the play is uh, in terms of uh, that recreation or recreation using genetic information. Okay, so the study, um, uh, is funded through the National Human Genome Research Institute, the, um, the Ethical and Legal and Social Implications Program. It is, uh, what I'm presenting here is part of, just one part of a study that's entitled Social Networking and Personal Genomics. Uh, one of the research questions that we were interested in is the reasons why uh, individuals decide to purchase uh, personal genetic testing. Uh, what do they do with it? What do they expect uh, to get out of it? What, how do they interpret their results? And who do they share that information with? Um, I don't have time to go into um, all the details of the study, but if you wanted to go to the website and learn more of that, um, there's more information there. Um, so just to give you a sense of the folks that we were speaking with, um, this is, I'm sorry, it's, it's really s small, but uh, <laughs> the average age um, of the folks that we talked with, um, and we conducted surveys and, and um, extended interviews with these individuals, um, was around 40, uh, early 40s, 80% um, identified as white. Uh, the medium income was between 50 to 100,000. Over 50% had advanced degrees. 75% uh, described their health as excellent or very good. And I think this uh, somewhat dovetails with um, the general population for uh, 23andMe in terms of their consumer base. Um, we asked them why they were getting testing, and I should say that um, I think you heard that 23andMe offers a, a, a broad spectrum of genetic test results, including ancestry, uh, disease-related risk, uh, carrier status, drug response, uh, genetics uh, with respect to drug response, and behavioral traits and whatnot. Um, so for the folks that we spoke with, ancestry seemed to be the primary reason, uh, followed by uh, interest in disease results. Um, and um, I think this, this quote is probably fairly emblematic of some of the reactions that people had to their ancestry uh, results in, in the sense that they felt they were part of a living history. And you see here, suddenly I feel like I'm living, um, I'm living history, but there's a strange feeling too because now I also feel like I'm not myself anymore. I feel like I'm just a piece of everyone else who lived in the past. So that's been a real interesting sidebar in terms of identity. If anyone has some kind of ego problem, listen to this, and they'll find out they're really just a, co a compilation of many other people who lived before. I'm part of a team. I'm part of a, uh, a worldwide team. Okay. So um, interesting in sense of, of, of giving perspective to oneself in terms of one's own personal history. We also asked our, our respondents to, um, to answer this uh, this question. Um, we presented um, an individual who identifies as African American receives genetic ancestry test results that indicate that she has 0% African ancestry, 87% European, and 13% Asian ancestry. I would classify her as, and we gave them a bunch of choices, and you'll see here that 16% uh, said, well, what she said is what she is, African, uh, uh, African American. 2% uh, said Asian American, 18% uh, European American. But you'll see a lot of people said other. And we were curious. We allowed them to write in what they thought other, what, what, what was their response. <laughs> and um, 
interestingly, um, and I think this is, this is emblematic of that group, um, the first, the lab probably had a mix-up, she really is African-American, but then there are other kind of more complex uh, responses saying mixed race, I, I don't think it's up to me to decide. Uh, many people believe race is a social construct. Uh, others talked about cultural identity, we, you know, it's not about racial blood quantum. Um, we can't leave that, we can leave that at the drinking fountain. I would call her Eurasian. And then this last one about, well, it depends on the context, okay? What we would call them, what would we, what would we call this person, how would we classify? And I thought that was really interesting in terms of kind of the complexity in which people are taking up perhaps um, their, their uh, hybridity in terms of um, the results that they are getting back. Another um, way in which ancestry results are given back uh, by 23andMe is um, ancestry painting, and this is, um, this is a demo picture, but it gives you a sense of the ways in which the chromosome is painted, um, and it's painted by continental uh, affiliation, I guess, uh, Europe, Asia, Africa, and, and, and not genotyped. And one response, I think, and, and I think this is also emblematic of, of some of the things that we were hearing from folks, um, is this person who, um, who talks about their European genes. And, and she says, it's, it's really, it really is beautiful. And she's talking about the ancestry painting. I showed my family all the different parts of my genes that came from Africa. I noticed that on one of the chromosomes, well, it seems a large region anyway. anyway. I mean, it extends further than other parts is European. And I was thinking, I wish I could find out what those European genes do. I think that I understand why I have European genes in me, given my history and all, but what do they do? So it's interesting to me that this seems to be an example of the imbuing um, of a, a racial category onto a chromosomal segment and this idea that functionality should somehow be part of that. And I, I think we should be attuned to the ways in which people perhaps are conflating um, some of these ideas about race, genes, and, and what do they do. Um, and here I just I, I remind us of, of Troy Duster's work um, and his uh, around the reification of race, and he he he, um, he advises us to think about the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, and I think that's particularly helpful in in this context, where there is a tendency to assume that categories of thought coincide with the object character of the empirical world, that we take them for granted um, for being something that perhaps is meant to be a heuristic. Okay, um, so I'm just going to describe one person's um, story uh, with her genetic ancestry testing, her family's uh, experience as, as an illustration, I think, of kind of the limits of recreation, of thinking about genetic ancestry as only recreation. And so, um, in the spring of 2010, I met um, Helen, who's a mother of three, and she, um, she was very interested in genetic ancestry testing. She chose 23andMe um, because she says that she felt that it was, uh, it was uh, filled with happy colors, quote, uh, straightforward information, non-threatening presentation of results. Um, and so she was interested primarily in genealogy, but she also thought that the health results that, they were, uh, that she was going to get back was an added bonus. Um, so when we sat down to talk to her, uh, when I sat down to talk to her about her results, she said, uh, she summarized them as, you know, I, my, my results are fairly benign. Um, I didn't have uh, much information in terms of disease risk that was remarkable. Um, she, in fact, somewhat dismissed her results, but um, was most interested in her ancestry information, but they failed to show the specificity that she assumed would, that she would receive. Um, she described her results as pretty much 100% European, and um, she was not surprised um, that her maternal haplotype originated in Central Europe, but she was hoping that her genetic results would settle a long-time argument she had with her sister about the exact location of their, quote, family village. She was dis disappointed that her results did not provide an answer. Okay. So a few weeks later, um, I meet Helen again, and I'm, I, I learn that she has decided um, to buy her daughter, who's um, a high school senior, um, a 23andMe kit for her birthday. And the reason why is she thinks that it would be a rare opportunity to teach her daughter some genetics and to give her a chance to discover her uh, genetic ancestry. Um, she thought this was particularly relevant for her family. Um, she explained that um, uh, that she was a typical white American married to a man um, who was born in China, so her, her children were mixed. 
and her hope was that genetic testing would give her daughter some, quote, fun in discovering her mixed heritage, heritage and give her a sense of who she is, end quote. Uh, what also appealed to her was the ability to test her child in the privacy of DTC personal genetic testing, um, where they, they would receive their results and no one else had needed to know about them. Um, she also it was, was attracted to this fun mode of self-discovery. So three months later, um, uh, she told me that her daughter, um, who was tested, um, uh, received her results. And when I asked her how things turned out, she said, things uh, haven't turned out um, like she thought they would. Um, she talks about how uh, they had decided beforehand that um, uh, Helen, the mother, would uh, have the password and she would log in um, for the results first to make sure that there wasn't anything um, uh, that she should be concerned about, which she did, and she didn't find anything. Um, but then um, she said when she gave the password to her daughter, um, she, she was surprised. Um, and she says, sorry, I'm going to skip these. Um, at first, I thought we were fine. Nothing jumped out at me. And you know, from the list with all of the red arrows, I thought, phew, what a relief. Um, and she's talking here about her health uh, information, her health disease uh, risk information. But then she, and she's referring to her daughter, came to me really upset later that day. Um, actually, she was in tears and pulled me over to, to the screen and pointed at her results. It was her Parkinson's page. And it said that she was almost three times the risk um, of the average person. I was really confused because I hadn't seen this before and I knew I wouldn't have missed something like this. I thought I had, um, I, I thought had they updated her results and then I realized what she had done, she had clicked on Asian. So the, the, um, the option that you have um, in some of these, uh, in, in this company is that you do at the, um, you, you are asked to identify yourself. And when Sarah, uh, sorry, Helen, uh, originally um, looked at her daughter's results, she had assumed that the daughter uh, would characterize herself as European. Um, but what the daughter had done is gone in and, and it clicked on Asian and it had changed her results. Um, and which is interesting because of the idea that, that on the one hand there is this, 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 this notion that we can create and profess our own identity, but it can, when it rubs up against a history, I would say, of using race as the major prism in biomedical research and in clinical medicine, we come back to these big categories. Um, and I think that this is something that we should, should be mindful of as we think about uh, genetic ancestry testing and the way in which it travels. Um, so, uh, just in summary, I, I would suggest that uh, genetic explanations of difference are powerful narratives. Um, for identity formation and that um, in interpreting genetic data, um, we must uh, be mindful of the confounding and conflation of genes, ancestry, race, and disease. How difference is that, it, um, how difference is imbued with meaning depends on the social context and historical framings. Um, and that it's important uh, to uh, understand the allure of genetic specificity um, in what Nelkin and Lindy have described as the DNA mystique um, and the illusion of precision and certainty um, when we think about uh, this idea of creating oneself, discovering oneself, um, and being able to define oneself. And I'll just end there. Um, I was told that we're not going to have time for questions. Oh. Okay. So what we'll do, we're taking a break, we will stay up here, and people who want to talk to us will be right here, okay? And then the next session we will pick this up with the notion of genetics and health. Thank you very much. 15 minutes.